Let's remain standing for the reading of the word this morning from Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 13. At this point in the story, uh, after the crucifixion of Jesus, he's been put in the tomb. Uh, Women rush to the tomb the next morning. They find it empty, right? If you've never heard this story before, this is high drama. All right. (laughs) Starting in verse 13. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you were holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly saying, stay with us for it is toward evening and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. Then they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the 11 and those who were with them gathered together, saying, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful For the resurrection of Christ, we are grateful for your word, which tells us the story. Lord, this morning, as your word is preached, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be at work amongst us, that you would open our eyes to see Jesus. We pray that you would open our hearts to receive him. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, before I get started, some of you know that there was a pickleball tournament yesterday called the Pickleball, Pastor's Pickleball Challenge, and uh, I'll just say we don't need to talk about it. (laughs) And I'll say that guy, Aaron, who was standing here on the stage singing like an angel today, he was like a devil on the pickleball court. That's all all I'll say about that. Uh, Great to see all of you, those who were participating. Great to hear great things about the, the women's tea yesterday as well. Well, anyway... Um, when I was in seventh grade, speaking of depressing things, when I was in seventh grade, um, our, our teacher had us read a poem, famous poem by Edgar Allan Poe called The Raven. Many of you read The Raven? Yeah. Uh, how many of you is that your favorite poem? Yeah, it's not a lot of people's favorite poem. It's a brilliant piece of art, amazingly dark depressing poem. For those who don't know, the, 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 the raven is basically about this man who is sitting and reflecting on his life, and he's basically mourning the loss of the love of his life, a woman named Lenore. And we're not told what happened to her exactly, just simply that she's not there. Probably she died is the implication. And he's sitting there pondering, wondering, is he ever going to be happy again? Is, he ever, is life ever going to be like it once was? Will he ever have a sense of the fulfillment and the, and the sense of joy that he had uh, before when Lenore was part of his life? And, and into the room flies this raven. And he begins to engage in a conversation with the raven. 
And as he's asking the raven this question about his life and will there ever be joy, will there ever be meaning, will there ever be a sense of hope again and, and will I get to see Lenore again? And the answer the raven gives famously is nevermore, nevermore. And everything he says to the raven, the raven's response is some version of nevermore. And the man ultimately seems like he's going mad by the end of the poem. Poe captures the depressing reality of life in this poem. There's no going back to the way things once were. The time that's past is past. You once were young, now you're old. There's no going back. The places you once lived, the homes which you once enjoyed, there's no going back to that. You can go back, but you can't go back. And if you tried to go back, you know that's true. We see pictures, photos of ones we once loved, and the answer the raven gives to us about them is nevermore. It's a sad, depressing, dark reality that Poe forces us to look at in this poem. And if we pause and we think about the reality of life, that is the reality. The reality is everything changes, everything comes to an end, death comes to us all, and over all of our lives are written those words, never more. Well, that's very much the spirit in which the disciples find themselves when we continue our story today where we left off last week. They're very much living under the pall of these words, this word, never more. Verses 13 and 14 tell us that very day, two of them, the disciples, were going to a village named Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. So it's still Sunday. This is the day that uh, th that culminated a tremendous week in all their lives. The previous Sunday, what we call Palm Sunday, was the day that Jesus, this amazing man, this prophet, mighty in word and deed, had ridden into Jerusalem on a donkey, giving every indication that he was the king that the Jewish people had been waiting for for a very long time. Everyone celebrated him. By Thursday, he was having what would be his last supper with them. And he instituted a meal at that supper that he told them, after I die, I want you to do this in remembrance of me. That very night in a garden called Gethsemane, he was betrayed by the religious leaders of the, the very people who thought this was gonna be the, the savior of us all. By Friday morning at 9 a.m., he was nailed to a Roman cross. By 3 p.m., he was dead. It was the darkest Sabbath they'd ever experienced that Saturday. And then that Sunday, some of the women had gone to take spices to the tomb to better cover up the stench of his decomposing body in the days to come. And when they got there, they found the stone had been rolled away and an angel speaks to them and says, he's not here, he's risen like he said he was gonna do. And the women came back and reported this to us. Peter went to investigate himself, didn't say he believed, but marveled that something seemed to be going on here. And this is where the disciples find themselves at this moment. Uh, two of those disciples now decide that they're going to take a walk back to this village named Emmaus. And we're not told why they were going to Emmaus, but the most probable reason why they're going there is because they lived there. And they had been in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, but they were going back to Emmaus now, going back home. And what's apparent is that even after the tomb was found empty, even after the women said that they got a vision from angels telling them that Jesus wasn't there, but he was risen, it's apparent that these disciples did not believe that was true. They were still very much under the dark word, nevermore. And we'll see that as we make our way on through the passage. By the end of the passage, however, 
These disciples, as well as the rest, went from not believing that Jesus had risen from the dead to believing that Jesus had risen from the dead. And what we want to see today is how is it that these normal, rational, sophisticated people went from not believing that he had risen from the dead to actually believing it and it changing everything in their lives for the rest of their lives. And the short answer to that is the, what changed is they got a visitor. They got a visitor, and that visitor walked with them, taught them, and then they came to recognize who he was. So that's how we're going to look at our passage today. We're going to talk about walking with Jesus, learning from Jesus, and ultimately recognizing Jesus. First of all, walking with Jesus. We read in verses 15 and 16, while those two disciples were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. <clears throat> so we can just acknowledge that this is strange. This is strange. If you're reading this for the first time, you're hearing this for the first time, you're like, but that's a weird dynamic to this story. Here are two guys, they're walking. They had lived with Jesus for several years. They had watched him. They had listened to him teach and speak. It was only Thursday since they had seen him last. It's Sunday. That's just a few days. And now suddenly this guy that they had spent years with learning from, looking at, they don't recognize him? That doesn't make much sense. You know, I, while I was writing this this week, I was thinking about the fact that I'm just completing 14 years here at Covenant. And my first seven years of ministry here, I preached quite a bit. And the last seven years, uh, I've preached most weeks. And as I was doing the math on that, if you've been here as long as I have, you've spent at least 250 hours of your life staring at my face. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> And hearing my voice, and that doesn't count any time that we might have spent with each other outside the context of this room and another conversation and so on. The bottom line is, if I saw you on Thursday and then saw you again on Sunday and I started walking down the road with you, you would recognize my face. You would recognize my voice, probably even if you didn't see my face. How is it that these disciples who spent years with Jesus, watching him, listening to him teach, suddenly don't recognize them as they're passing down the road. Well, what we discover, the text makes it plain in verse 16, is that their eyes were kept from recognizing him. It doesn't say they didn't recognize him. It says their eyes were kept from recognizing him. This is what we call in biblical studies a divine passive. God is not mentioned here, but he is the implied actor who is keeping their eyes from recognizing Jesus. There is a supernatural blinding that is happening here. This is why they're not recognizing Jesus in this moment. Well, that doesn't make this story any less strange. Because if you're wanting people to believe that Jesus rose from the dead, it would seemingly, one would think that the last thing you would do is to blind people. That the last thing you would do is to cause them not to recognize that that's Jesus who's walking with them along the road. So what's going on here? Why would this be? And you know, we're not told exactly why, so we kind of had to try to put it together just by, by reading the story. But I think what's happening here is that the reason why God does not allow them to recognize Jesus right away is that if they had recognized Jesus right away, they would not have heard anything else that Jesus said from that moment on. And they actually needed to hear what Jesus was going to teach them even more than they needed to see him. And that actually remains true for us today. It's actually more important that we recognize the Jesus who is revealed to us in the scripture than that we would physically recognize the living body of Jesus. So Jesus says to them in verse 17, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. You can imagine the scene. Jesus is there. He knows what they're talking about. What are you guys talking about? And the disciples can't hide the fact. They're, they can't hide the fact that they're sad. Because the one they had hoped would be the Savior, he is dead. And so nevermore is written all over their faces. They are, they are sad. And so they say in verse 18, and then one of them named Cleopas answered him, 
Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? You know, this is the only time Cleopas is mentioned in the New Testament, probably. And he gets the unfortunate distinction of being the guy who, when Jesus asks a question, says to Jesus, are you stupid? (laughs) He's like, that's my one cameo in the Bible. (laughs) how, how, How do you not know this? How could this guy's head be so far in the clouds or so deep in the sand that he doesn't know what just happened in Jerusalem over the course of last week? And what's interesting about this little detail is that it tells us that the the arrest and the crucifixion of Jesus was not a small thing. This was not done in a corner. This was the talk of the town. Everybody who was in Jerusalem at the time would have heard this. They would have known something about what was going on. At least that's what appears to be the case as, as Cleopas asked him that question. So, Jesus, though, um, he says in verse 19, he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. So Cleopas gives them the very short story of what happened in the course of that week. This man, Jesus of Nazareth, who they understood at least at this point, now that he was dead, to be a prophet, a great man, mighty in word, did amazing things. And our very own spiritual leaders handed him over to the Romans who crucified him. And he died. And they're sad. You see, as Christians today, we celebrate the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross for us. But the only reason why we celebrate the fact that Jesus died on the cross for us is because we believe he rose again from the dead on Sunday. If you think that Jesus only died, that's not good news. Our response would be much like these guys, who is, yeah, he was a great teacher, impressive man, but he's dead, so what does it matter? Christians believe that Jesus not only died on the cross as an act of humanity's worst act of injustice ever, but we believe that because the the Bible teaches us this, that at the same time that humanity was conducting the greatest act of injustice ever, God was working in and through the evil acts of humanity to accomplish the greatest good for humanity that would ever be done. Jesus was unjustly dying at the hands of these wicked men. The Bible says that at the same time, God was actually judging the sins of all of those who trust in Jesus. He had taken our sin, the things that we have done that are wrong. And and we all have some version of that. We're all aware at some level that we're not exactly the way we're supposed to be. We haven't always acted exactly like we should. The Bible calls that sin. And, And God actually took our sin, placed them on Jesus, and gave Jesus what we deserved to die, to experience the full weight of God's righteous anger at the wickedness that exists in this world. He died in our place there. And so we, as Christians who believe today, we can celebrate the resurrection because we believe that when Jesus died on the cross, he took away our sin, and then he rose on the third day, which was the indication that God accepted his sacrifice as our substitute, that our sins really are taken away, and that when Jesus rose from the dead, we actually experienced a kind of spiritual resurrection to start to live a new life right now with the promise that one day our bodies will actually be raised even as Jesus' was. But they didn't get that part yet. All they knew was that he died at the hands of the Romans. And so they continue in this sad tale in verse 21, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him 
they did not see. But we had hoped. Those are some of the saddest words that a person could ever speak. But we had hoped. No longer do we, but we did. This is a hope disappointed. And what they had specifically hoped was that he would be the one to redeem Israel. The word redeem means basically to set free something which has come to be enslaved. And they understood in the, in the first century as Jewish people that their nation had come to be enslaved by the Roman Empire. They weren't free. And they had hoped that Jesus would be the one who would set their nation free from the Roman oppression. And the next thing they know, the one who they had pinned all their hopes on was pinned to a Roman cross. And hope died there with that. You see, what they believed they needed most was deliverance from Roman oppression, but actually they needed a greater redemption. They needed to be set free from a worse tyrant than the Roman Empire. And it was that tyrant that Jesus came to set them free from. And the tyrant is who the Bible refers to ultimately as Satan, the adversary, the devil. And not just the devil, but actually the, the evil that is part of every single one of our lives and hearts. The, the reason why you don't do the things you want to do and you do the things you don't want to do. And you can't seem to stop or start. It's this that Jesus came to set us free from. And the way that he came to set us free from it was actually by taking the judgment that that, that part of us deserves. So that the hold it has on us is broken. He accomplishes that through his death. The Bible tells us in another place, if we've died with him, if we share in that death he died on the cross, then we also live with him. And we live with him having been set free from the things that formerly held us captive. That's why he died there. But they didn't recognize it. And we see that they didn't recognize it because even after they tell him this story, even after they heard the report of the women, they still didn't believe he was alive. And so that leads to the next part of this story that is learning from Jesus. We read in verse five, Jesus said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. I want you to notice those first words he says to them. He says, oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe. We might have expected that coming right on the heels of them saying that some women went to the tomb, didn't find the body there, an angel told him why he wasn't there, and they came back and told it to us, and we didn't believe it. You might have expected Jesus to say, oh, foolish ones, slow to believe people you ought to trust that I've risen from the dead. He doesn't rebuke them for not believing the women. He rebukes them for not believing the scripture. That's very interesting, and I think very telling. You haven't believed the things the prophets have spoken. And so it says, starting with Moses, Christians and Jews traditionally believe that, because the Bible tells us this, that the first five books of the Bible were written by Moses. And then he just refers to basically all the rest of the Old Testament books as the prophets. And Jesus says, you're slow to believe everything that the Old Testament says about me. Now, if you're maybe a little bit familiar with Christianity, you might say to yourself, I thought Jesus shows up in the New Testament. And it's true, Jesus does show up in the New Testament. But what Jesus says is he's all throughout the Old Testament. He's everywhere. <laughs> and if you're properly reading the Bible you will see Jesus, not just in the New Testament, but throughout the Old Testament. And so for the, over the course of these seven miles, Jesus gives them what must have been the most amazing Bible lesson that anyone has ever experienced as he walks them through the Old Testament, showing them all the things that it says about him. If you don't understand that all the Old Testament is about Jesus, then you will likely read the Old Testament as something like 
a collection of morality tales, kind of like Aesop's fables. That story of Adam and Eve is a story about, you know, don't eat fruit or whatever that fruit represents. And the story of David and Goliath is David conquered his giants by being brave. You conquer your giants too. And the story of Daniel and the lion's den is, you know, stand up for what you believe. And if you get thrown in a lion's den, you won't get eaten. The, the, those kind of things, morality tales. But that's actually not what those stories are about at all. There is a level of morality that is taught to us through those scriptures, but sometimes it's very difficult to figure out exactly what that is. Rather, what Jesus says is all of those stories are pointing to him. The story in Adam and Eve is ultimately pointing to the fact that we need a better Adam to represent us. The story of Abraham is the story about another one who left his father's house in order to become a blessing to the nations. The story of David and Goliath is about the fact that there's a greater champion even than David who would defeat even greater giants than Goliath that we could never face down ourselves. That Jesus is the greater high priest. Jesus is the better prophet. Jesus is the, the better king than those that the Old Testament chose to us. He's the better sacrifice. He's the better lawgiver. All of these scriptures are pointing us to Jesus. And we'll know we're reading it rightly when we see him revealed throughout the whole of the scripture from the Old into the New Testament. It's absolutely stunning that this collection of 66 books written over 1,500 years by many different authors all is telling the same story. But we often don't see it just like the disciples didn't. And the, the great theologian B.B. Warfield helps us understand why. He says, the Old Testament may be likened to a chamber richly furnished, but dimly lighted. The introduction of light brings into it nothing which was not in it before, but it brings out into clearer view much of what is in it, but was only dimly or even not at all perceived before. You know, you can walk into a dark room and maybe you see shadows of furniture and other things in that room, but you don't, you don't see very clearly what's in there. He says, the Old Testament is like that for us. We read it and we can kind of get, get hints and shadows and so on about someone, someone greater that's to come, but we don't see it clearly until someone turns on the light. And that's what Jesus is doing in this passage. He's turning on the light so that we can see what the Old Testament reveals and what it reveals is that it's all about him. He is the key to understanding the Old Testament and the New Testament. And when that light comes on, you can't walk into that room the same way you did before. Now we start to see Jesus everywhere that he's meant to be seen. And that leads to the third piece, recognizing Jesus. Even after Jesus explains all of these things, they still don't know who he is. But they get to Emmaus and they're hospitable enough to at least invite him to come in and stay with them because it was already pretty late. And so this is what we read. Um, they come in and, and you, you expect, if, you're, if you've invited somebody to dinner, uh, you would be the host and your guest would be the guest. But something happens in this dinner that's unusual and the hosts, they don't know who Jesus is, but they recognize something about him that's enough to cause them to say, when they walk into the table, you know what, why don't you sit at the head of the table? and lead this meal. And Jesus does. So we read in verse 30. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. Again, let's just acknowledge this as a strange story. And, and I just wanna ask you, as you know, you're 21st century, you're sophisticated people. If you're, wanting, if you're wanting to make up a story to try and convince people that Jesus actually rose from the dead, would you tag this story onto it? <laughs> that these people who didn't know Jesus, who they had spent multiple years with, and now a few days later, they're walking down the road with him for seven miles, probably a couple hours at least. They don't recognize him. They don't recognize his voice. But when they sit down to have a meal, he breaks bread, suddenly they see who he is, and right when they see who he is, pff, he disappears. Would you write that as part of your story? 
I would not include that. If I was trying to convince people of something that I knew was not true, I would not add this as a reason to believe it. The only reason I would write down this story is if this is what happened. And it's again why I think we can say that the, the, the reliability of these stories is very much tied up with the fact that they're hard to believe in the way that they're written. If you were trying to convince people of something, this is not how you would write the story. If you were simply recounting what you saw and experienced, then this is what you would write because that's what happened. And that's exactly what they do. What is it about the way that Jesus takes this bread, blesses it, breaks it, and gives it to them that causes them to see? We're not told. But what is interesting is that in Luke's gospel, in two other places, these very same verbs, almost identical, show up. And the first time they show up is in the story of when Jesus feeds 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fishes. A, another miracle story. But here's what happens in the context of that story. It says in Luke 9, 16, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. Do you see the verbs? He took, he blessed, he broke, he gave. A little bit later, on the Thursday night before these events happened, something very similar happened happens in the context of the Last Supper. And there we read in Luke twenty two nineteen, 19, and Jesus took bread and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In this case, it's took, gave thanks, broke and gave it to them. Interestingly, at that meal, Jesus said, I want you all to continue to do this over and over and over again. And later in our service this morning, I'm going to do exactly what Jesus said to do. I'm going to take bread, bless it, break it, and give it. And we are all going to partake together. And what Christians believe is that actually in doing that act that Jesus has told us to do, even as he has done, there is some sense in which we come to recognize him in a profound kind of a way, as something of a mysterious kind of a way, just like this story itself is, is a bit mysterious. We're not told that we receive some kind of a different grace by partaking in this meal, but that, that same grace that we hear through the preaching of the word comes to us now through our senses as we reenact this meal that Jesus gave to his disciples to perform. So Jesus does this, and in the breaking of the bread and the giving of the bread, their eyes are opened. Again, the divine passive. Their eyes are opened because God opens their eyes. And now in this moment, they see Jesus for who he is, and as they do, he vanishes. <clears throat> then we read in verse 32. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road? while he opened to us the scriptures. They now recognize what it was that was special about that experience as they were walking with Jesus. They said their hearts burned within them. It's a bit of a strange phrase, but let me try to help you explain it. So if, you're, if you're here visiting, uh, those, some of you may have come last week for the first time and you, and you heard my invitation. You said, I'll come back for the next couple of weeks. Thank you. Thanks for, for coming or for tuning in online, wherever you might be. But you might wonder, why is it that Christians do this every single Sunday? Why do they keep coming back and, you know, for 250 hours or more of their life, listen to somebody like me talk to them from this ancient book? And the answer is that Christians believe that when this book is read and taught, that it's not just human words, but that God himself is actually speaking through these words. And that our hearts burn within us. There's something compelling about the message that we hear. We recognize these are not the words of a man. These are the words of God. He speaks to us through this book. And that's why we keep coming back to hear it. That's why we open it in our homes and with our families. And we, because we long to hear his voice. And our hearts, there's a, there's a burning 
of love and desire and of truth that we sense through this. And that might be even why you came back a second week, because maybe you also sense there's, this message feels different than, than other things I've heard. It's different than the typical self-help things I've heard or things that I've read. There's something that feels like there's substance to it. This, I believe, is God working in your life through this word, through this story. And I just want to say, if you're in that place and you, you feel that, then, then follow the example of these first two disciples who didn't believe, but who sensed there was something special about Jesus. And I just want to encourage you to invite him in like they did. Just to invite him in, to come and sit with you and to show you like he did with them the things that are true about himself. Another place in the scripture describes Jesus as being absolutely willing and eager to be invited to come in. At one point he, he says about himself, he says, I stand at the door and I'm knocking. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and eat with him and he with me. He is totally ready to be invited in by you. Will you invite him in and just see what he would show you? And it can be as simple as, you know, I'm not going to give you any kind of like religious mumbo jumbo to say. He understands you. Just as simple as, Jesus, I invite you to come in and show me who you are. Show me what this is all about. The story continues in verse 33. They rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the 11 and those who were with them gathered together saying, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is amazing. The very same hour, they just walked seven miles to Emmaus. And by the way, if you've been to Jerusalem and surrounding areas, this is not a flat Naples walk. <laughs> this is hill country. They just walked seven miles. That very hour that they'd seen Jesus, they turn around and go back the seven miles to Jerusalem. It's the exact same road, but the journey was totally different. The seven miles they walked to Emmaus were filled with despair, sadness, hopelessness. The seven miles back to Jerusalem filled with joy and hope for the future. What was the difference? The difference was Jesus. The difference was they had met the resurrected Jesus Christ. They now knew in a way they didn't before, even when people had told them that he had risen from the dead. They saw it in the scriptures and then they saw it with their own eyes and it changed everything. Friends, we are all traveling the same road the road of life. We're all walking it. We all face highs. We all face lows. We all face triumphs and we all face tragedies and they come in different forms, but it is the common human experience. We are all, we all go through it all. And I'm not saying today that if you become a Christian, suddenly your road gets easy. In some ways it actually gets harder. But I am saying that your experience of walking on the road will be completely different. Right now, as you walk down the road, the word over the road is nevermore. But if Jesus is risen from the dead and you're walking with Jesus, there's a new word written over your life. Evermore. Evermore. The resurrection is the difference between nevermore and evermore. If Jesus really is risen from the dead, then everything is different, including the sufferings and the trials that you will face in the course of the rest of your life. To paraphrase another pastor named Tim Keller, he, he says the resurrection is about, it's not just about consolation. It's not like a consolation that, you know, when you die, things will be better. It says, if the resurrection is true, then it means there is a great restoration in the works. In other words, 
If the resurrection is true, then, then when, you, when you die, you not only get your life back one day, but you get back the life you always wanted and never had in this life. If the resurrection is true, you not only get your body back, but you get the body back you always wanted but never had. Your body as it was meant to be. If the resurrection is true, you not only get your loved ones back who are in Christ, but you get your loved ones back as you always wanted them to be and they never were. <laughs> Amen? Amen? <laughs> and they get you back as they always wanted you to be. And you never were. We not only get this world back, but we get this world back as it was meant to be and as we've never even yet experienced. If the resurrection is true, then one day we will look at death and sorrow and sadness and pain and hate and evil and we will say to it, never more. Even while Jesus ushers us into a kingdom of love and delight and joy and says to us, evermore. Yeah. It's hard to believe. It's hard to believe, but it doesn't mean it's not true. And I would just say to you again today, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's pray together. We thank you, Lord, for what you've shown us in this scripture. We thank you even for the unbelief of the disciples that led to this amazing story of your revealing yourself through the scriptures, a privilege we still get to enjoy to this day to open this book and to see who you are and hear you speak to us even still now. We thank you also for the privilege of this supper that you've prepared for your people in which we remember what you have done for us, in which we remember that you are the bread of life who satisfies the deepest hungers of our hearts in a way that nothing in this world ever can. For those here who don't know you yet this day, I pray that you'll put it upon their heart even to invite you into their life even now. now. To open the door, invite you in, invite you to show yourself to them. And I pray and trust that you'll do precisely that. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.